welcome back to Dig It Detecting, guys. Welcome also to a very exciting video. We have the boys here today, and we're in Bendigo, and we're going to go down the Deborah Gold Mine of some 60 meters underground on a guided tour. And I thought I uh, thought it best to take you guys along with us and uh, give you a look. And not only that, we are going to attend the Gold Prospecting Expo over the next two days and uh, give you a look at that also. Uh, so we've got the marquees there, Mine Lab, Detect Ed Products, PMAV. Uh, Coil Tech, Miner's Den, they're all there and we're going to give you a look at, uh, as we go. So we've got the boys ready, ready to rock and roll, go down the mine some 60 metres and I can't wait. Uh, so stay tuned and uh, we will see you there. So here we are guys, the Central Deborah Gold Mine. We just found a park and we are ready to go inside and check out the, the gold mine that goes 60 metres underground. What do you reckon Dom? You going to get stuck underground? No! No! Well, we're inside now and we've just got our map, the visitor map, with all the attractions and what have you out there. And uh, we're waiting for our guided tour to start. And so we're gonna walk you around and give you a bit of a look at what's inside here, uh, some, of the, um, some of the attractions to see. And uh, then we're gonna wait for our guided tour, as I said, and uh, we're gonna go down 60, 60 meters underground. Some really cool uh, little attractions here too. I'll just, um, just give you a look. Uh, boys are sort of um, having a wander around, checking it all out. That's how they used to mine all the rock, Dom. Yeah, drill, like this. drill into the rock. Yep, pretty cool. And uh, this is how they used to cart it all out, buddy, on the old cart, on the rail system. See the rails in the ground? Yeah. Down here. See the rails? Yeah. So the cart would go along the rails. Yeah. But. Do you reckon you could push it? Button. Do you reckon you're gonna give this bloke a rest and you push it? He might need a rest, he's missing a hand. Oh, let's keep walking around and having a look. So we found our way into the tram carriage and uh, the boys are driving for us. Where are we headed guys? Straight ahead. Straight ahead. Take us up the street. Take us to Macca's. Oi. You gotta, hang on, you gotta ring the bell first. Let your passengers know. Ding ding. So you gotta call out all aboard. All aboard. <laughs> Righto. Alright, I'll go sit in my seat with mum. We'll sit down in the carriage here. Righto, take us to Macca's. Oh, you're gonna shut the shut the door. No. Straight ahead, lads. Kilometer down the road in a suburb of Bendigo called Golden Square by a couple of farmers' wives, and that kicked off the gold rush here in Bendigo. Right, within six months of that first gold discovery, there was over twenty thousand people here. Okay, now what they're looking for to begin with was alluvial gold, surface gold, easy to find specks and nuggets you find in creeks and gullies. But within five years, most of the good alluvial gold was gone and had been mined out. So what miners in Bendigo started doing, they started following the quartz reefs they'd found at the surface, started following them underground. And that's what Bendigo was world famous for, it's underground quartz mining, which is what we'll look at today when we get down there in the dark. Now they continuously mined gold in Bendigo for 103 years, from 1851 all the way through until 1954. And in that 103 years, 22 million ounces worth of gold came from underground in this town, around about 700,000 kilos. Right, that makes Bendigo, by those numbers, the second largest gold field in Australia, second only to Kalgoorlie in Western Australia. Here in Victoria, Bendigo found twice as much gold as its next closest rival, which was Ballarat. Right, Ballarat found 11 million ounces, Bendigo found 22 million. I'm not a competitive person. Bendigo's number one, get around. <laughs> right. Now the mine where you are right now, the Central Deborah, we opened up in 1939, we closed in 1954. We only operated for 15 years and we operated right at the end of that historic mining period in Bendigo. We were the second last mine to close. Now before we run off underground, the big white tower over here, okay, that's what we call a poppet head. In modern mining they call that a head frame. It always stands over the top of a mine shaft and our mine shaft's just on the other side of the fence. The mine shaft was the only way in or out from underground back in the old days. So to do that, miners jumped in those mine cages. Four at a time, they'd squeeze in the cages. Shoulder to shoulder, everyone's good friends. Lunch boxes on their feet. The way they went underground to work. Now we very clearly have doors in the cages these days. But back in the old days, no doors on those cages. They're rope-sided. You get your elbows stuck in when you're going underground to work back there. 
Find cages are attached to the winding cages. They go all the way to the very top of the poppet head. Over the top of the big wheels at the top, they're called sheave wheels or winding wheels. And you can see those cables drop all the way down onto the winding engine over there in the engine room. The winding engine was the most important piece of equipment on a mine site because it was the only way you could raise the lower mine cages in and out from underground. And that's enough of the surface stuff. All right, you want to get a proper idea of what mining life is like, we've got to head underground. So let's go down this way and do that. We're all going to wear helmets underground with me today. Those helmets stay on your head the whole time you are underground. They do not come off for any reason. If they fall off by accident, that's okay. Pick them back up, put them straight back on. But do not take your helmets on or off on purpose, please. If you keep taking them on and off on purpose, that's when we'll have a talk about coming back up to the top. It's a safety thing. It's a law in Australia. It's not because I'm the fun police, I promise you. So pretty please keep your helmets on your head. Once you've got your helmets on and you're happy with the move down this way, so I can see who I need to help, and you can turn your cap lamp on as soon as you come through with your helmet. Once you're happy with your helmet, move down this way. Here you go, Dom. Get your light on. Is your light working? Yes. Tilt him up a little bit. There you go. How do you go, Saz? Cap lamps on, everybody. We're happy with the helmets. Happy, happy, happy. Look at that. Your mullet's still hanging out the back. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our rally map lift and it's going to take us 90 seconds to get to level 2. If we were to go underground in the old mine cage, it only takes 20 seconds. So this thing's nice and slow and relaxing for us, alright? Nice and calm. Are you ready to go? Yeah. Righto, 3, 2, 1. Doesn't no matter how slow I can. So the rise we're going down in today was first put into the mid-1980s, purely so we could take tourist groups to level 2 which is why I don't have anything else more interesting to tell you about it. 90 seconds is an awkward amount of time. It's like when you put something in the microwave for a minute and a half. You don't know whether to watch it, go away and do something else. I've got nowhere else to take you though, so we're just gonna ride this one out. <laughs> now the first thing you will notice when we get underground, there's a lot of groundwater down there. It can be damp underfoot, that is normal. A lot of groundwater under Bendigo is the main reason most of the Bendigo deep mines had to close and could not afford to get all that water out. Okay, Central Deborah, no different. We work three shifts a day here in this mine. Two of those shifts are underground mining shifts, but every night, no miners underground. They take off the mine cages, replace them with baling tanks, and for eight hours every night, up and down, up and down, baling water out from the bottom. About 100,000 litres worth of water a night shift they can pull out using those baling tanks. So groundwater always has been and always will be a problem if then you go mining. Use big electric pumps in these days, though, so that's okay. How many people have you had freak out as you're taking them down? Some. 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 <laughs> what do you do? What do you do? Go back up? Uh, I'll, I can talk. I can talk anybody into anything. <laughs> if they need to go up, we can send them back up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Move over towards the doors there and just wait for me. That'd be fantastic. Just, just asking for a friend, Haley. Just asking for a mate. <laughs> me? I've been under plenty of shafts, but they're not not as safe as this. Alright, what I'm going to get you all to do, okay, once that puddle's down, move down to the mine truck and wait for me at that mine truck, please. Move down to the mine truck in the middle of the track and wait for me there, please. Don't worry about it. Yeah, my shoes got that. That's alright. Beautiful work. Stop before the air from the mine truck. Right, what we're going to do to begin with is we're going to have a look at the mine shaft here. So what I'll get everybody to do, nice big semicircle round here in front of me, post to post. Right, stay in front of those posts for me though, otherwise I'll end up with water dripping all over. Mini miners, I'll get you to stand in front of mum or dad or whoever you're here with today just so that you can see. Mini miners, you are the highest ranking officers underground with me today. Okay, make sure you can see. Right, we're now 61 metres underground. 
by about 200 feet, maybe about the same height as a 22 storey building. That's how far underground we are today. And behind me here is that mine shaft we talked about very quickly at the surface. Now the mine shaft here at Central Deborah is 422 metres deep. It's got 17 levels in it, which sounds like a long way when you say it out loud, but it's not by Bendigo standards, it's shallow. Okay, the deepest mine in Bendigo was the Victoria Quartz Mine on Victoria Hill. And that mine was 1,406 metres deep and had 37 levels in it. Right, was considered the deepest mine in the world at one point. So what you're standing in right now is a baby mine. But don't worry, I've got plenty of gold left in the wall to show you later on. Okay, you're going to see the good stuff. Right, to put it more in perspective for you, the average mine depth in Bendigo is 800 metres. So this mine's only a touch over half of that. Mine shaft's broken up into four different compartments. You can see them running across the front here. Middle two compartments are your winding and haulage compartments, and that's where the mine cage is moved up and down, carrying men and equipment like the mine truck just there. Mine trucks hold 500 kilos worth of rocket material. The compartment over the other side, okay? Looks like it's all boarded up. We call that, the, call that the smoke box. It acts like a natural chimney. It actually sucks air out from underground, which is a good thing. We want that to happen. It helps with air circulation. But more importantly, at the end of every shift, miners use the blast the rock apart with explosives, which creates a lot of dust and fumes. The smoke box helped to draw the dust and fumes out so it was safe for the next mining crew coming underground. And your lucky last compartment is the one over the other side of the ladderway. Right, the ladderway is how miners climb out from underground, usually when the mine cages weren't working. And that happened from time to time. Okay, the mine cages were completely controlled by the winding engine at the surface. That winding engine we've got was built in 1896, and this is the fifth different mine that it's worked on. Every now and again, gave itself a rest. A bit of a breather. So that's when miners use the ladders. So from here on level two, might take us 15 minutes to climb back up the top. That's not too bad. Right. 17 levels in this mine though. So from level 10 and below, a miner was looking at a climb of two and a half hours. That was after he finished an eight hour mine shift. He didn't get paid to climb the ladders either. He climbed out for free and he carried out any equipment he took down with him at the start of his shift, like his lunch bag, he carried that out with him as well. Not my idea of a fun time. Now, I know I have climbed the ladders before. I've climbed down to level 10 before it was flooded, climbed back out again, didn't take me two and a half hours, but I hadn't worked an eight hour mine shift, I wasn't carrying anything, and they most definitely paid me. I'm not climbing the ladders for free, I promise you, okay? <laughs> Ladderway helps with air circulation, naturally draws air into the mine, all right? This is how we control airflow, all controlled naturally by the four compartments you can see. Now your shaft is all lined with timber, that's red gum, from up near the Murray River, all right? Red gum loves a nice, damp, wet environment, and as you can see, this is a nice, damp, wet environment. Okay, water is lazy, it wants to get to the lowest part of the mine it can find, that's always our mine shaft. Okay, so the shaft's the wettest part of the mine and that's why they use red gum in there to keep it strong and safe. Last thing about the shaft, communication. No telephones down here back then. No buttons lock on the alley mac lift we just came down in. So miners down here had to be able to communicate with miners up there. So what they used to use was a big long cord that ran down the inside of the mine shaft called a knocker line. It ran all the way up to the surface and was attached to some bells in the engine room. All right, so what they had was a code of signal, sort of like miners Morse code. All right, so the miner underground, pull on the knocker line, ring the bell at the top, depending on the code, the miner driver then knew exactly where he was and what he wanted. All right, that's how they communicate. These days, just use red electric buttons on every level, that's a bit easier. All right, there are telephones on each level as you go underground as well, but the further underground you go, it gets hotter, it gets wetter, it gets more humid, the phones break all the time. So these buttons are pretty important to us because if they don't work, that's when we're climbing ladders and no one wants to do that. All right, I've never seen someone come out of the ladderway dry. Right, it's not much of a fun place to be. You can hear the water running down the shaft there right now. Uh, one last thing in this area before we move on and I dry off a little bit. Okay, The area where we're standing has a name. It's called the plat. Every level has a plat. All right, it's just a big area off the front of the mine shaft, big enough for us to skid mine trucks around or store equipment against the wall. It's a Cornish term and it means platform. There's a lot of Cornish terms in Australian mining because the Cornish have a big influence on Australia's underground mining history. Right, so for those of you that don't know, the Cornish came from Cornwall, southwest part of England. Over there they used to mine tin and copper. Hard rock mining though. All right, so when the gold rush hit here in Australia in the 1850s, the miners started heading underground into Australia's hard rock, looking for all the good stuff, right, looking for the gold. Cornish miners came along, bought expertise and knowledge in hard rock mining, and they bought terminology. So you notice quite a few different techniques and nicknames as they move around today. Shows you their impact. Any quick questions here before we move on? Yeah, this way we go.
Uh, what we've got here in Bendigo are called saddle reefs, and it's a type of saddle reef structure that Bendigo has that make it successful. Nova Scotia in Canada, they have a similar saddle reef structure that Bendigo does, but outside of that, there's not too many other places around the world that have them, so we're lucky. Okay, so what happened was, 480 million years ago, this is the bottom of the ocean. All right, layers of sand and silt built up on top of each other, and over time, they harden into rock, sandstone and slate. Basically, all the rock in this little section here is either sandstone or slate. All right, fast forward 450 million years ago, there's compression in the Earth's surface from the east and west, and slowly over time, it started squashing the flat layers of rock together. All right, so instead of having flat layers of rock, the rock under Bendigo is forced into big waves like this. Sort of like a big sheet of corrugated iron is a good way of looking at it. Also explains why Bendigo's gold field is 15 kilometres north-south, but only four or five kilometres east-west. It's all been squashed together. Now, the parts of those folds that move up on angles you call anticlines, the parts that slope down in a way you call synclines. Most of your gold is usually found towards the top of your folds in your anticlines. Right, that's because in that folding process, big gaps opened up. That allowed space for something called silica from deep in the Earth's surface to be forced up under pressure. Silica is a liquid substance. It contained gold and other minerals, filled the gaps up. All right, when silica hardened, hardened into a white rock we call quartz, and that's what miners are looking for. They're looking for quartz reefs, because underground in Victoria, gold is only found in quartz reefs. So to find your gold, you had to find a quartz reef first. So what do they do? Sink a mine shaft. First tunnel they dig is what we're standing on right now. It's called a cross cut because it goes across those layers of rock. Then we get to a point where we change direction, dig a tunnel in a north-south direction, we call it a drive. I like to think we're driving into the rock, driving after the gold. So we don't call them tunnels down here, we call them cross cuts and drives. But basically the reason Bendigo was so successful is because saddle reefs here are predictable. Because they sit one on top of the other on top of the other. Like big sheets of corrugated iron stacked on top of each other. Usually those reefs were spaced out 25, 30, 40 metres apart. So when a miner went underground and found a quartz reef, he knew if he went down again, there was going to be another one there. And below that one was another one, and another one, and another one. Right, that's how you can sink a mine shaft that's 1,406 metres deep. You just keep going down. Right, predictable mining is easy mining because you know where to go. Half the battle in mining is knowing where to dig. Saddle reefs show you exactly where we want to be. So we like them, aren't they good? I think a few of you probably guessed what this area was used for, right? a bit of a lunch room, a bit of a smoke eye room, miners call it a crib room. Okay, crib is a Cornish term, it means light meal or lunch, and miners had meal breaks underground. Right, they worked an eight hour mine shift, like I mentioned to you earlier, and they had to spend every minute of those eight hours underground. They were not allowed back to the surface for any reason, not for a meal break, not for a toilet break. Right, two good reasons for that though. Reason number one is productivity. Mining's all about getting as much rock out from underground as quick as you can. If you have lunch down here, as soon as you finish eating, you can get straight back to work. All right, so productivity is reason number one. Reason number two is to stop people stealing gold. Avoid eye contact with you uh, The more times you're moving it out from underground, the more chance you've got of sneaking a piece of gold out, hiding it up the top, not getting caught. Stay underground for eight hours, you've got less chance to successfully sneak gold out, which is why there was a second way they tried to stop people stealing gold. It wasn't the surface, it's in the dirty change room. In that dirty change room worked a man called the rag picker. Now the rag picker's job, go through every miner's clothes as soon as they come out from underground, make sure there's no gold in there. All right, check his boots, make sure there's no gold in his boots. Ears, nose, have a talk to the miner, make sure there's no gold behind the back of his teeth. Big beautiful beard like mine, gotta comb that out, make sure there's no gold stashed away in there anywhere. Go through the miner's hair, everything. All right, showers in the change rooms as well, no doors on the showers in the change rooms. All right, and having a shower after your shift was compulsory so the rag picker could watch the miners wash and make sure they hadn't tried extra hard to sneak gold out. A lot of people think I've made the last part up or I've just said it to be rude, I promise you I haven't. Right, I'm not telling you the rag picker was a popular man, he's not. All right, but he had a very important job that he had to do because at the end of the day, if you were caught stealing gold, you sent to prison. You didn't just lose your job, you went to jail, it was a serious thing. All the uh, gold underground for the mining companies. Miners are just paid to pull it out for them, exactly like it is working in a mine today. One last way to stop a miner stealing gold too. Right? Pay him well. Pay a man well enough, he doesn't want to steal gold. He wants to come to work, earn his money, go home again. So the basic weekly wage there, he was above average for the time. Okay, so 1952 is an example. The basic minimum wage for a miner underground here was 12 pounds a week. That's above average. 
Right, and today's money, that equates to a little bit over $800 a week. So it's not bad, but a lot of miners are on what we call the contract or piecework system, which means they get paid for the amount of rock they remove from underground. So if you're good at what you did, you could earn two to three times the basic weekly wage. So the guys who weren't on contracts, they were the guys who attempted to split up. It's quite obviously dark down here as well. All right, it is pitch black underground without light. Your eyes never adjust to the darkness, all right? So you need light. Early days, of course, all they used were candles. This piece of metal that the candle sits in here is called a spider, all right? You call it a spider because it just hangs out between any two pieces of rock in the wall. It hangs out like a spider hangs out the wall. A creative name for things underground you'll find. But in the early 1900s, a man-made rock was created called calcium carbide. Right, when you mix water with calcium carbide, it created a gas called acetylene, which is the same gas you use in welding. So what they invented, the Bendigo bucket lamp. Okay, so at the start of every shift, miner takes a canister like this to the carbide room, which is at the surface, fill it up with calcium carbide. These canisters have a tiny hole in them towards the top there, really, really small. Okay, fill your bucket up with water, drop your canister into the bucket of water. Water drips through the tiny hole, mixes with the rock, creates the gas. Gas comes up the spout, light it with a match, and you had a light that was 15 times brighter than the candle on the wall. This is the light and the lamp they used down here for the entire 15 years of the mine operate. Even when battery powered cap lamps came along in the 1940s, they were still using these things. All right, because flame, fantastic indicator of air quality. All right, flame dims, miners know they need better air circulation where they're working, but they also lit fuses on their explosives at the end of every shift to blow the rock to bits. All right, light your fuses with these. Right, bucket lamps lasted four hours and you refilled the water in them here on your crib break so you can finish off the rest of your shift. Okay, should point out too, no seats or tables in the crib area. It was just a part of the mine where you sat on the ground, had a bite to eat, got back to work. Right, I'll probably have a miner's pasty for lunch. What you know is a Cornish pasty. One of those pasties is half meat, half apple, so you've got your main meal and your dessert all in the one pastry. Right, the traditional name for that is a tiki had quite a few English people on my tours recently pick on my pronunciation of the word tiki yogi, but that's because I sound like a bogan, it's not my fault. We blame mum and dad for that, just don't tell them the same time. Alright, miners' toilets. Alright, nicknames for everything underground, alright? So we don't call this thing the miners' toilet, the nickname for this is the Thunderbox. Alright, now I'm not showing you this because I think you need to know how a miner goes to the toilet. I'm pretty sure we've all got that covered. I'm showing you this because some miners felt it's a very successful way to steal gold. Okay, so what they used to do, get a piece of cloth, put a piece of gold in the cloth, wrap it up, chuck it in the Thunderbox can. When that can was full, the youngest bloke in the mine, the 16 year old mining apprentice, it would have been his job to empty the can. Take it up to the surface and just dump the contents of the can on the muller keep up there, the big pile of waste rock, that's all that he with it. That's when our miner comes along afterwards and I guess you could say he tries to find his nugget. That's the best way I've got to describe it. Right? Now that's a gross way of stealing gold, right? but they felt like it was quite successful. Okay, and it's also a lot less painful than trying to swallow it. All right, so there you go, Thunderbox, good way to try and steal gold. So you mean to tell me all the muller keeps I've climbed up in my past, uh, we've probably had that. Thunderboxes dumped on the top yeah, of them. Yeah, there, there, there may have been, there may have been, absolutely. <laughs> I never knew that. And all the good stuff go. was picked clean. There you go. I was going to say, how many rocks has I've only ever found lead shot. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on up this way. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to with you again. Alright, you can see here that we've turned the corner. So we've moved off our cross cut, now moved on to a drive. So we're getting towards the centre of the anticlinal fold where we're going to find our quartz reef with gold in it soon. Miners like to call this area centre country. And I've stopped you here to point out the wooden structure we walked underneath just then. Very important piece of safety for our miners. This is what they used to build whenever they felt the rock was unsafe and they needed to protect themselves. Alright, so here in Bendigo we call these timber sets. On different gold fields, they do go by different names over towards Ballarat. They like to call them talking timbers, but here in Bendigo, we just call them timber sets. All right, so, made of legs either side. Big guy across the top is the cap, and all the boards that run along the roof or run along the walls, we call lagging. All right, the lagging's the important stuff here. That's what catches the rocks, or what miners called scats, whenever they fell from the roof or fell from the walls. Right, now, usually you wouldn't use nails when you built these things either. It's wet and horrible down here all the time. Your nails rust out quickly. Your job as a miner is to get rock out, not to replace rusty nails. So what they used instead are the big joints on the corners here. They're called jog joints. All right? Because of all the moisture down here, it made the timber swell, made the joints really tough. Okay? Coupled with wedges that run along in between the roof of the mine and the lagging that force everything down nice and firmly. Put yourself a nice firm structure that requires basically no maintenance. Now this is just local timber. Right? We don't use red gum like we do on the mine shaft. 
Okay, we just use whatever trees were closest to the mine. So in Bendigo, that's either ironbark or grey box. All right, if you've ever seen any pictures of the gold fields, there's never any trees in those pictures. All right, it's because they're all down here, cropping up mines. Right, so on the hill at the back of the university in Bendigo called One Tree Hill. That requires no explanation from me, don't Okay, now you weren't considered a proper miner until you mastered timbering, and that could take you five years to learn properly, because as I said, your main job is to get rock out, not to spend a heap of time building those. Right, so there we go. Timber sets. Any questions about those ones? No. Right, eh? What do you reckon, Soph? It's not cold. It's not cold? You never get cold. Just a bit further up, sitting against the wall. Here's someone with a bit more over here in the background. Which one? Youngest. Alright, so what you got to remember, right, Chief? Are you ready? I'm the most selfish man in the world. Alright. I only ever worry about me. Alright, so I'm never gonna take myself somewhere where it's dangerous. Because right? yeah. I worry about me too much. Alright, so if I'm down here, you're fine. You're safe as houses if I'm down here. Alright, so I'm the most selfish man in the world. Right? Just remember that, right? <laughs> you're safe. Quick look over the roof. You can see we don't have a lot of support in this little area. Okay, you don't need support everywhere underground in Bendigo because of how hard the rock is, but it did mean at the start of every shift, miners check the rock anyway, make sure the rock's safe. Right, that technique's called sounding or sounding the back. You always nickname the roof of a mine the back because over in Cornwall, where they'll dig a rock off the floor, their back always pointed to the roof of a mine. So you always nickname the roof of the mine the back. Okay, so what they do, grab a pinch bar, hit it into the rock, listen to the noise that it makes. That's it. All right, nice solid sound, a ringing noise like a bell, ding a ling a ling, thumbs up, rock safe, keep mining, no problems. All right, makes an echoey hollow noise though, a little bit like a drum. That's where we might have to do a little bit more work. That's thumbs down. All right, so what they might do is grab their pinch bar and try and smash the weak rock out of the wall. It's called barring down or scaling. It's something we still do down here. If that doesn't work, that's where they build timber sets or in more modern mining, it's where they put in rock bolts. All right, so all around the walls, you see those square metal plates with circles in the middle of them? Those are rock bolts. They're a modern way of keeping the rocks safe. You're gonna notice them the whole way around the loop as we move around today. I'll explain how they work briefly in a minute. First things first though. All right, mini miners, I've got a job for you. I'm gonna hit the rock, I'm gonna make the noise, you crew are gonna tell me whether the rock's safe. No pressure, all good. All right, remember, it makes a ringing noise like a bell, ding a ling a ling, give me a big thumbs up, echo and hollow like a drum, thumbs down. All right, feel good with that, lads? I know you're all right with it, you're all okay. All right, all good? Position this quickly. All right, oh. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Safe. Safe, two thumbs up, I like that. That means it's very safe, beautiful work. What about that one? Two thumbs down, you spot on. Don't worry, mum, that's why there's a rock bot yeah, there, right? Safe. I'm safe. Can't do that without a rock bot, too much paperwork involved, right? Too much paperwork. Well done, mini miners, did a great job. Now, timber sets took a long time to build, so when rock bolts came along, it made life a lot easier for miners. So the type of rock bolt we use down here these days are these things, they're called split sets. Okay, developed in the US in the 70s, made of spring steel, all right? Now, spring steel naturally likes to stay open, which is why there's a big, long gap down the front of them. Okay, so what the miners do, all right, they drill a hole in the rock that's a bit narrower than the split set, so it's longer, and using the same drill, drive the split set into the hole. All right, smaller hole, closes the gap in the front. Spring steel, steel wants to stay open. So once you finish pin, it's drilling it into the rock, all right, it actually pins itself against the walls of the hole it's been drilled through, pinning the layers of rock together. Each one of these split sets can hold up to seven tonnes worth of weight. Okay, so all around the walls, you see those square metal plates, circles in the middle of them. It's the end of a split set, roughly this long, holding up to seven tonnes. Okay, it usually protects an area half metre radius of the way around. Right. You see here we've got mesh on the wall as well. Mesh does the exact same job that lagging does. It just catches scats wherever they fall. And if we really want to, spray it all with concrete. Well, it's called shock creating. Some of you might have noticed that the rise we came down in today was shock creating. If you didn't notice, don't worry. We've got 90 seconds on the way back out to memorise it. You haven't missed that much. It's just concrete on the wall. But unless anyone's got any questions, gold time. Wood ends. Wood ends. Oh, I like 
Oh, Helena, I got my torch on your bum. Inside the courts. Mm -hmm. Everyone's as best we can. There is gold in all three of the windows. Oh. So it's labelled in the front windows. The front two windows it is not labelled in the back window. It's like advanced level. Where's Wally down there? So you crew down the back will be expert miners by the time I finish going on about it. All right, what we've got here is a small quartz roof. You can tell we're in the middle of an anticlinal fold because there is a dome shape to it up the front here. You'll notice it a bit better as you walk on past. This is a small roof. The further underground you go, the bigger quartz reefs can be, but this one's still got plenty of the good stuff in there, still got plenty of gold. Now, not every quartz reef was mined. It had to be profitable to mine, all right? So that means for every ton of quartz they pulled out from underground, they had to find at least 10 grams worth of gold. One ton of quartz, that's two mine trucks filled with the white rock. 10 grams worth of gold is about the size of the top of my little finger. That's it. That's all they had to find for that to be considered profitable. So 15 years worth of mining here in Central Deborah, we removed 64,000 tons worth of quartz. We removed 40,000 tons worth of mulling, the waste rock, that grey sandstone and slate for a grand total of 929 kilos worth of gold, a little bit under a tonne. Right, we were considered a very profitable mine, even though that amount of gold today is worth over $75 million. Right, we were considered very profitable back then. Right, we averaged 14 grams of gold per tonne here in this mine. Now, I can hear you thinking, Baz, if this wasn't a profitable mine, why is there gold still here in the wall, mate? And the answer is the old timers did not find this reef. The closest they got was 10 metres on the other side of the wall up here, about a week's worth of mining away. Right, it was World War II, short staff, ankle deep water, no sign of the quartz reef, they gave up. Moved down to level six, never came back here to level two. But also here you're thinking, but Baz, if you guys came along afterwards and you found the quartz reef, how come you didn't take the gold? And the answer is there is more money in tourism. There is a small amount of gold I got here in the wall. If I take the gold out, I've got nothing to show you. All right, so I left it in there for you crew to look at. All right, now your gold's got that rich yellow looking color to it, but yes, it is quite small. All right, in actual fact, the gold we've got underground here is considered big. Usually what miners are looking for is a lot smaller and a lot finer. Okay, the problem is I start talking about gold and people start thinking about big gold nuggets like the welcome stranger or the hand of fate, big beautiful things the size of your head. All right, that's alluvial gold, it's surface gold. And even though alluvial nuggets could be big like that from time to time, there's just not that many of them. Far more gold trapped underground in hard rock like this. 80% of all Bendigo's gold came out of hard rock like what you're looking at right here, right now. All right, it's not as romantic as pulling a nugget the size of your fist out of the creek, I'll get that. All right, but there's just far more of it down here. All right, one last thing there on the walls to keep an eye out for. Some of you noticed it already. It's called Iron Pyrite. Anyone know the other name for Iron Pyrite? Fool's, Fool's Gold. Fool's Gold, spot on. Spot and on. there's a very, very tiny, tiny, tiny amount of gold in Fool's Gold. A ridiculously small amount. Maybe 3% if you get incredibly lucky. But you've got to use a lot of nasty, nasty chemicals to leach the gold out. And that was never something we did here in Central Deborah. All we did was collect it up and sell it off to someone else who could be bothered trying. That's the best way I've got of describing it. All right, so your fool's gold sparkly, it's shiny, it's pretty, it's all over the back wall here. Don't fall for it. All right, it's that rich yellow color that you're after, not the sparkly, shiny, pretty stuff. Okay. Get up there, have a look at your gold, have a look at your fool's gold. Once you've done that, make your way down this way. If you're having trouble spotting the gold, call out and I'll come down and help you. Let's have a look at this one quickly. This is my favourite bit, this is my favourite bit here, right? You know why? I think I can touch it. Have a go, have a go. No? Oh, nearly. Close. Oh, close. While you're looking at your quartz reef, have a look at the colour of it as well. It's not plain white. Lots of different colours in there. Greys, blacks, browns, oranges, yellows. That's the sort of colour a miner's looking for in a quartz reef. What that shows is so that when the silica came up from underground, it was bringing heaps of minerals with it, so you got a far higher chance of finding a good amount of gold in a quartz reef with a colour like that. Plain white quartz reefs usually got left behind. You ain't going to find profitable gold in a plain white reef. You want colour like this. This particular sort of quartz reef is called a laminated quartz reef, by the way. Sort of looks like a rock lasagna, the way it's all laid up on top of each other. Lance, have you tried to touch it yet? I've tried 
No, you got the bottom campaign. I tried to touch it and I touched it. Healy? Nearly. 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 So you are the reef snake that's way down the wall here as well. Very pretty cross section. What's that? That's a hook or a loop or a spike. Okay, you notice we've got some up high as well. So usually what they do is put pipes, air lines, water lines, all that sort of stuff through them so they don't hang out, hang out in the floor so we can trip over them. They're out of the way. You can touch it. You touch it? Yeah. Did you get it? Which finger touched it? Oh. Keep squeezing the air. All the way over there in the middle. A little bit more, mate. You gotta make it that easy. You gotta grab hold of it and put it in your pocket. You're one gross spurt away, I reckon. One gross spurt away. Not a bit of fool's gold there. There's one other way you can tell you're looking at gold here on level two. There's perspex in front of it. Okay, no perspex, no gold. Just remember that. All right. Move on down this way. This yellow dusty stuff that you're gonna walk past here as well, that's sulfur. Makes the Bendigo Creek smell like rotten egg. Okay, so if you walk through Roslyn Park in the middle of Bendigo, got too close to the creek, it smells a little bit. Right, it's because of this stuff. It's because of the sulphur. Right, it's not because of the bats. Leave the bats alone, it's not their fault. Right, it's not because of the drain. Right, it's because of the sulphur underground. That's what makes the creek smell. Right, because there's bats in the park in the middle of Bendigo. And some people think it makes the creek smell, but the creek was smelling long before they got here. Right, bats have only been in Bendigo about 15 years, and the creek was smelling long before they got here. Lots of protection in this area as well. Right, I want you to pick the rock, picture the rock under Bendigo like a piece of paper. If you fold the piece of paper in half, right, it's the fold that's naturally the weakest part of a piece of paper. Right, the rock structure under Bendigo works the same way. Right, so the top of those folds is naturally going to be the weakest part of your rock structure, which is why there's lots of protection here. It also explains why we sink the mine shaft about 100 metres to the east of where they think that quartz reef is. Right, that's hard rock, that's safe rock. Never sink a mine shaft on the quartz reef. Don't need to kick the wall. The wall's done, hasn't done nothing to you. Okay. Right, oh, we're going to carry on in this way. We'll have a look at our drills. Yeah. Right, oh, so what we're going to do from the corners all the way around the walls. Make sure we can all see. I like the goals. It's not bad at stuff. I'm going to admit you up. I like making loud noises. I'll admit it. Righto. The rock underneath Bendigo is five to seven times harder than concrete, right? You can't just take to the walls of the pick like you do in Minecraft. That's not how it works down here. Right? What you've got to do is drill holes in the rock, fill them with explosives, blow the rock to pieces. Right? It's called drilling and blasting. Right, early days, this is the technique they used to drill those holes. Right, it's the hammer and tap technique, it's a Cornish technique. Quarter turn at a time, chip away a hole in the rock, then you have to fit your explosive in. Right, sort of looks like this in action. Now, I've been doing these two is for a while, that hole has not got any deeper. Alright, so one man can do that job far easier to do it in a team. So what they used to do is have one man hold the drill steel, one or two other miners with those hammers, swinging as hard as they could. Okay, working in a team like that, you can drill a one metre hole in four hours. Well, what you need at least 12 what holes. Yeah, and they break their finger and they keep on going. Alright, don't worry, everyone got to go hold the drill steel. You just kept on working. All right, because one, one hole, four hours, you need 12 holes for an effective blast pattern. All right, it's a slow way of going about it. And that's what they used to do underground until they had enough space to get compressed air lines down to run pneumatic drills. All right, so the big green guy over here in the corner is what we call a stroker or a reciprocator. Right, came along in the 1880s. This particular one was built in Bendigo around the same time, so it's over 140 years old, weighs 150 kilos, you can drill a one metre hole in 40 minutes, it takes quicker. All right, but there's a massive problem with it. It kicks up heaps of dust. Dust fills the air, miners breathe it in. What they're breathing in contains silica, which is a natural form of glass. Settle in their lungs, and they develop something called silicosis or miners complaint. The life expectancy of a miner using a drill like that one was about 40 years of age. Right, that's why they nicknamed the widow makers. Okay, silicosis was the biggest killer across the gold fields by a long, long, long way, more than any why other cause of death. Because of the dust. 
Right. You feel, you feel it in your, you're breathing in, it's sat on your lungs, and that's not good for your body. All right. The life expectancy of a miner using that drill 40 years of age. Okay. Biggest killer across the gold fields more than any other cause of death. Got to give them credit though. I only took roughly 20 years to figure out that all you had to do to get rid of the dust was have a man standing here with a hose of water pointed at the hole. And it took 20 years to figure it out. Okay. This drill here, though, is my favourite. This is the drip the drill. This is the drill we used here at Central Deborah for the entire 15 years the mine operated. Right now, drip the drills came along in the early 1900s, but what you need to know about them is that the drill still is hollow. Okay, so that means that as the miner's drilling, you can pump it full of water and get rid of all the dust. Turn it into a mud called slurry. So they eliminated that dust problem. Right, all that water running through there also means your drill tip stays cool, so it stays sharper for longer. It's more efficient, it's more effective. This drill could drill a one and a half metre hole in 15 minutes, and I'm going to turn it on for you. All right, but it is going to be incredibly loud, so what I need you all to do as best as humanly possible is to block those ears for me. Fingers in your ears for me. Righto. Fingers in ears. Ready. Set. Imagine doing that for 20 holes, 15 minutes each, every shift, no hearing protection. No earmuffs, no earplugs, you put your fingers in your ears. A lot of hearing loss, a lot of hearing damage from using these things. Right? Your other problem with your hands sitting on there, rattling and rolling around all day, you've got nerve damage in your hand as well, something called white knuckle. So even though they eliminated the death element of using drills, there are other health concerns associated with them, unfortunately. One last drill we'll show you. Everyone here, I'll get you to take a step back for me so those guys behind you can see. All right, last drill. This one here, it's an air leg drill. It's a more modern drill. More modern drill. All right, came along in the 1950s. Only weighs 50 kilos, so it can be moved around and operated by one man at a time. Still runs on compressed air. Still got a hollow drill steel, so you can pump it full of water and get rid of all your dust. And an air leg drill can drill a two metre hole in five to 10 minutes. It's far more efficient and effective. All right, but unfortunately, it was also far too expensive. Uh, there's a handful of reasons this mine was forced to close. One of those, re one of those reasons uh, was using old, outdated equipment like roof to drills. We hadn't been able to purchase these more modern drills in the 1950s. Happy days. We operated for longer. Just couldn't afford them at the time. Still used in modern mining too, by the way. Smaller projects, but they are still used. Uh, so there's still a handy drill to help. Just couldn't have had it here when we were operational. Yes, mate? How long did you do When they first came out, they cost £120 brand new. All right, now the drifter drills cost 200 pounds brand new, but we already had 14 of them. All right, the problem with Bendigo mining is there's a lot of reusing and buying old equipment off other mines. All right, so for us to get those drills, we would have had to have sold our other drills. No other mines in Bendigo operating at the time to sell them to. Okay, so that's why we couldn't afford these drills. Right, we've drilled our holes in the rock. We don't just drill holes wherever we feel like it. We've got to drill them into patterns. Patterns are the most effective way to blast a rock apart. So the pattern we use here at Central Debra is this one you can see here in the corner. It's called the Bendigo Drag Cutter. It was developed for use here in Bendigo wherever drift of drills were used. Like the one I just demonstrated for you. Based off a Cornish pattern. Of course it was. Now you start off the holes on the top there. They're called back holes. And every half metre down, Drill another series of holes until you reach these yellow ones here that are angled down towards the floor. They're called cut holes. Right? They're supposed to be miners waist height, to call for little fellas, right? And the last ones you drill out are the ones down there on the floor. They're called lifters. Clean them all out, pack them full of explosive. Right? Our explosive of choice is this stuff up the top here, jelly knife. Right? We used jelly knife because it was a safer explosive to use. All right? <laughs> <laughs> Jelly knot would not blast the part unless there was a detonator attached to it, unlike a lot of earlier explosives like dynamite, for example, which had the ability to just blow up for no real good reason. All right, you can drop an unlit stick of dynamite in your feet, still blow your feet off. So we like jelly knot, it's good stuff. Now you can see here we've got blast cord as well. Blast cord's cut to different lengths because we need these explosions over here to go off one at a time in a specific order. Right, you want the cut holes there to blast down first. Bang! 
creates a weakness in the rock. It gives us an area for those explosives above it to blast down into. Bang, 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 one at a time. They blast up to the back holes and the last ones to go where the lift is to the floor. Oh, the lifters would pick up and just dump all that rock and material out of the cross cut or drive so it's easy for the next crew to clean it up. All 16 to 20 tonnes of it. Alright, so to set it off, Miner grabs his Bendigo bucket lamp that we looked at earlier, he lights up all those fuses and then he walk all the way back around to the plat where we started our tour underground today and that's where he stops, that's where he waits, that's where he counts. He counts all 20 of those explosions before he goes back to the surface. I only counts 20, beautiful, job's done. Jump back in the mine cage, back to the surface you go, day's over. You only count 19 or 18, that's when there's been a misfire and something's gone wrong. Okay, so what the miner did then, he went back to the surface anyway, and told the next crew, next crew's problem. Uh -huh. It's not because he's been lazy, it's because if you come back too soon after a misfire and it blows up the lay, that's when people got hurt. Plenty of time between every shift for everything to settle down, and the next crew knew how to handle that problem. Safety first. I only had one death in this mine and it had nothing to do with an explosive accident. Okay, safety first. Last pattern is the one here in the middle. Oh, it's a burn cut, it's a more modern pattern. Right, use an air leg drill to drill this pattern in if you want to. We don't use explosive to create the weakness in the rock anymore. We just use a bigger drill bit and drill the weakness into the face, like you can see there in the middle. Right, around that weakness, that's where you drill your smaller holes. Out and out and out, diamond square shaped patterns until you reach the width and the height of the drive. It's those smaller holes you're gonna fill with explosive. Now, we don't use gel ignite anymore. There's more modern explosives available for us. We don't use blast cord to set it all off. We use electric detonators. And we certainly don't just move 50 meters around the corner and hope for the best like they used to do in the old days, right? Safety standards have changed just a touch, all right? But what I will do, keep your eyes on the burn cut here in the middle. I've got it all wired up, ready to go. I will show you what we're talking about in terms of a pattern or a sequence. Right, you ready? Fire in the hole. And a mum used her son as a human shield when I set that off once. I don't know what she thought was going to happen, but the trust wasn't all that strong in me, clearly. Starts off nice and small around the weakness, moves further and further out. It's expanding the weakness, which is the basic principle all blast patterns work on. They're expanding the weakness the miner created in the rock. Right, they'll blast back as far back as the holes are driven. Right, so the bend you go drag cut there was a metre and a half. The burn cut behind me here, about two metres. Not the sound they're listening for either. They're feeling and counting the vibrations. Right, sometimes those vibrations were so strong they could feel them at the surface, so much so that the publican over the road of the National Hotel, he could feel them. So we knew we had about 30 minutes to have 30 beers locked up on the bar for knock off time. Good early morning system for yeah. Always a pub within 200 metres of a pop it in the video. It's a safe business plan behind us. Any quick questions about blasting? No. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> no, I know. We've got one last stop to go. If you aren't tall, please watch your head just down here. There's a split set that likes to take a load of tall people. Not a problem I've got, but if you are tall, watch your head up here. Who's talking to you? I think so. <laughs> yeah. No. You're running it, yeah. I know. You had to hit me yet. Rasa, my sports done. I don't know. What do you reckon it is? Dozer. 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 There's a, there's, a, there's a clue to it written on the side. Rubbish shovel. Righto. Hey, you guys can move up a bit more and more. Just then, I need something to do. Righto, last stop. In Australian mining, when you get rid of rock from underground, it's called blogging or blogging out. And here at Central Deborah, we use a very specific piece of equipment to get the job done. Shovels. 15 years worth of mine and that's all they use down here to get rid of that rocket material from underground. All right? The nickname for these things is the banjo based on the shape and the sound they make going across the rocks. Right? Now miners always worked in pairs using banjos. They can fill a mine truck like that one in the corner with 500 kilos worth of rock in 10 minutes. Then they have to push it all the way back around to the plat. That could be up to 500 metres away. Get an empty mine truck there, push it back again, and keep doing that until they got rid of 16 to 20 tonnes worth of material. That's before they drill holes in the rock, before they blast the rock apart on top of any other job they did down here, like building timber sets or sand. That was your eight hour shift every time you were down. Right, clear rock, drill holes, blow rock to bits, so the next crew could do the exact same thing. 
All right, so you can push those cross cuts or drives back a metre and a half a shoot. That's how Bendigo got its goal down from underground back then. A lot of hard work, a lot of effort. It had to be fit and strong. This yellow thing, though, made life a little bit easier for miners when it come along. It's called a rocker shovel or a rail, block, rail bogger. All right, came along in the late 1930s. It runs on compressed air exactly like the drills do. You only needed one man to run the machine. All right, there would have been a platform hanging off the side the operator stood on. Got your controls on the side there, bucket at the front, drive it forward, pick up your rock, swing the bucket over, fill the mine truck up in two minutes. It's heaps quicker. All right? But it loves a nice big open area like where we are now, and that's not the sort of space we had in this mine when we were operational. Our cross cuts and drives back then were about this wide and maybe this high. Right? That thing takes up most of the space. Not only that, it weighs two tonnes, and the only way you get it down is in the mine cage. Mine cage is too small. Got to take it apart, bring it down one piece at a time, rebuild it down here, that's no good. And more importantly than all of that, Banjo's are cheaper at the hardware store. It always comes down to money in the end of mining, and these are heaps cheaper than this. Okay, the reason this one's here is because they used it back in the 1980s when they expanded their cross cuts and drives with supers. Just couldn't have had it when we were an operational mine, unfortunately. Any last minute questions down here before we go around to the lift and go back up to the surface? No. No. Anyone else? No. no. We are underneath the creek right now for a bit of orientation for you, alright? That's not why it's wet down here on the floor. It's because all cross cuts and drives slope downhill so all that natural groundwater can drain away. Right? And all that water that miners would have been using in drills can drain away to the low point as well, which is usually the mine shaft. So we're at the low point of the mine. We are underneath the creek, that's a bit of orientation. All good? Yeah. Down this way we go. Yeah, it's still like super quick there. two lines that operate on the outskirts of the Benji. Yeah, Victoria would be very hard pressed for the lines anywhere you'd be allowed to put this Yeah. Oh! Oh, yeah, that's it. I'm done. 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 I'm
Uh, that was just amazing though, 61 metres down underground at the uh, Bendigo uh, Deborah Mine. And uh, I'll tell you what, if you're in Bendigo, I encourage you to come and do it. It was just fantastic. And so was the guide, Baz. A, uh, a wealth full of information. And I just thoroughly enjoyed every, every bit of that. So, And I really hope you guys did too. Anyway, we're off to the Bendigo Prospecting Expo for the next two days. Uh, to give you a bit of a look around, as I said, we've got the Mine Lab Marquees, uh, Coil Tech, Miner's Den. Uh, it is all happening there. And we're going to give you a look. So we're off for some lunch now. I really hope you enjoyed that. Stay tuned. As I said... We'll see you at the expo.